we maybe just have five more minutes or so? How about uh, 1015? Sure, Judge. Also, the court will uh, advise the jury that today we are adjourning at 3 o'clock. Yes, Judge. Okay, thank you. We'll stand in a recess. All rise. This honorable jury court now stands in recess. You want to get copies of this?
Peter Kaiser. Have you concluded your discussions, Attorneys uh, McGinnis? Good morning, Judge. Yes, uh, we have. I believe the defense is uh, signing the stipulation right now. Um, there's two stipulations, Your Honor, um, relating essentially to chain of custody issues with respect to evidence that Detective Riley seized and was subsequently submitted to the state laboratory. Um, I'll just indicate that the defense has asked that the state ask a few clarifying questions on direct examination of this witness, um, essentially indicating that most of these swabs taken by Detective Riley were not tested for confirmatory blood, human blood testing at the laboratory, that they were simply sent for DNA analysis. And I indicated to counsel that I, I didn't have an objection to um, asking those questions. The witness who ordinarily would testify to that is expected to testify sometime next week or so, depending on how the schedule goes. But just to short circuit it, I'm just going to ask those questions. So what the court will probably do is uh, ask that the stipulation uh, be presented to the court after uh, the state's questions. So judge, if I may. Uh, unless there is cross-examination. Well, there's another reason maybe not to do that. It's, uh, and if I may interject, I think this is why we're agreeing to this. What this is is basically a flow chart. We're skipping some of the chain of custody material. So I, to, to facilitate that flow, it may be necessary at least to put it up or to mention it beforehand only because this witness is going to be testifying the testing things that came from and makes it sound like it was uh, picked up at the garage and whisked to her office when instead there are a couple of intermediate steps that would need to be clarified. We don't need to do it in cross-examination. If it goes in this way, at least it explains that uh, skipped step, if you will. So you have the flow chart, correct? It's, a, it's, a writ, it's not in a chart form, but it's essentially that. My intention, Your Honor, was um, essentially to publish the stipulation with each exhibit so that this was identified as State Police 12. It was submitted to the, the State Laboratory and re-designated as Laboratory Submission 2, for example. And then can you please tell us the results of 2, right, and just sort of go through it that way. And so I'm going to publish the stipulation as we go along. Um, if the court would like to review it in advance, uh, I'm happy to tender that now. Well, what the court has to do is explain to the jury what a stipulation is. Of course. And so what the court will do is wait for counsel to indicate that uh, it may be an appropriate time for the court to explain what a stipulation is. And I'll note we've signed the stipulation. Um, two, there's two stipulations. Um, it was one other, I, I think it, it's just that... Uh, there was one additional uh, remark that it's not just that several of these things were not tested, but that some were tested and were negative for blood. And the reason this is important is the stipulation uses the same name that the police used, and it often mentions Castlemeyer and Luminol. And of course, this goes back to whether, you know, my concern about it being in at all, but since it is, for most of these, there was never a confirmatory test, and then some that were tested came back negative, it would give the, the false impression, perhaps, to the jury that when there was DNA, that it was actually, that it was blood DNA, when in fact it was um, skin cell DNA, even though it was taken from something called a blood-like stain that tested positive for KM, but it's to get that clarified because of the uh, reference to those uh, reagent presumptive tests. Well, are we ready to proceed? Um, there's just one other thing I want to put on the record, and the state did share this with us, and I just want to raise it now so it doesn't happen in the future. The witness who was here yesterday had been instructed specifically by the state not to mention a firearm. 
So this is a witness who then apparently deliberately violated an instruction. And that's why I wanted to let the court know that if we have concerns about any other witness, we would need to have either a sidebar or a discussion outside the presence of the jury. Perhaps if the court had admonished the witness, she wouldn't have disobeyed the instructions by the state. Well, the court would not have known that the state instructed the witness not to mention firearms. Your Honor, if I could just be heard on that. I don't think that Ms. Almeida deliberately violated any sort of instruction. The question was phrased by me, I think, a little inartfully. I had not appreciated the fact that she had mentioned the gun when asked whether or not, you know, what she had relayed to the police. I was expecting to just hear that there was a missing mother. And, you know, she apparently misunderstood. And so it was completely inadvertent. You know, as the court knows, what we're doing here is a tightrope act. And these things are going to happen from time to time. But, yes, the witness was instructed not to mention the gun. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, what happened happened. But I don't think there was any sort of deliberate, you know, attempt to circumvent the instruction by the state. And I'll also just add, Judge, that I had actually offered for Ms. Almeida to be present in the room during the offer of proof and the argument on the uncharged misconduct. And the defense did not want her present. And I specifically indicated that I would hope that she would be present. So perhaps that is another way to handle things in the future, that the witness could actually be present for some of the arguments so the witnesses understand exactly what the scope is. And I indicated at that hearing that I would not be eliciting evidence of the firearm. So I just want to say that I think it was completely inadvertent. And, you know, that's all. Thank you. Are we ready for the jury? Yes. You can bring the jury in. The counsel stipulates in the presence of all of the jurors. Yes, Judge. Thank you. Attorney McGinnis. Your Honor, the state calls Kristen Maydell. If you could please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or solemnly and sincerely affirm as the case may be that the evidence you shall give concerning this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God or upon penalty of perjury? I do. Can you please state your name and spell it for the record? Kristen Maydell, K-R-I-S-T-E-N-M-A-D-E-L. And your affiliation? I work at the forensic lab. Ma'am, you may be seated. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Ms. Maydell, who employs you? The State of Connecticut Forensic Science Laboratory. Where is the Forensic Science Laboratory located? It's located at 278 Colony Street in Meriden, Connecticut. How long have you worked for the State Police Forensic Laboratory? Next week will be 20 years. 
What is your position in the lab? I am currently a forensic science examiner, too, in the DNA unit. What are your duties at the laboratory? Um, my main duties are to extract DNA from items of evidence that may contain biological stains or material. I uh, perform analyses. I develop a DNA profile when possible, write reports, and testify in court when necessary. I also am a supervisor in the DNA unit, so I uh, supervise two FPC ones or forensic science examiner ones within the unit on their daily duties. I am the quality control coordinator for the DNA unit also, which is means that I make sure that all the reagents and consumables that we use in our DNA testing process are checked before they're put into use for casework. And I'm also the um, contact person for missing persons cases that require DNA testing. I'm going to hand you um, several exhibits that have been marked for identification in states 18 through 28. I'm just going to show you states exhibit 18 first. What is states exhibit 18? This is my CV. And I have provided a copy of that to turn show on movement into evidence at this point. Can I just see which one it is, please? Is it referenced by number? So if I could just look at the. No objection. Is that States 18? It is, Judge. States 18 will be admitted as a full exhibit. I'm also going to hand you States 19 through 26 for identification purposes only. I just ask that you hang on to those for now. And if I could just have a brief moment with Attorney Schoenhorn. Now, you mentioned that you work in the DNA portion of the laboratory. Can you tell the jury what is DNA? DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, and it's the hereditary material found in the cell that makes you who you are as an individual and an organism. DNA is passed from parent to child, where you get half your DNA from your mom and half your DNA from your dad, and DNA, nuclear DNA is unique to an individual, uh, except for identical twins. Before you proceed, ma'am, there's an interpreter, so we would ask that you would just slow down your delivery so that the interpreter can interpret accurately. Okay. No Thank problem. you. What are some sources of DNA? Uh, you can get DNA from cells in your body. So uh, cheek cells within your mouth, uh, blood, saliva, body fluids such as semen. Um, there's DNA in the roots of your hair, nuclear DNA, um, bones, and teeth. What is the purpose of DNA testing? DNA testing is a forensic tool of comparison. So we want to try to include or exclude a possible uh, person as being a contributor to that evidentiary profile. So we develop a DNA profile from a known profile and the evidence, and we compare those to see if they match. How do you obtain a DNA profile? We use uh, standard protocols and procedures that are accepted throughout the United States and the world. First, you want to get the DNA out of the cell. So you open up those cells and extract the DNA. Then we want to see how much DNA we have. So we want to quantify that DNA. After we know how much DNA we have, we want to go make many more uh, copies of that DNA. So we amplify it. Think of a photocopier. And then after that, we want to separate those DNA types so we can uh, develop a DNA profile, which is represented by a series of numbers. Approximately how many DNA profiles do you typically compare to evidence in a given year as either a primary analyst or a technical reviewer? Oh, thousands. Does your equipment also have the ability to tell you whether or not one or more of the contributors to a DNA profile are male or female? 
Yes. What is a mixture? A mixture is when you have a DNA profile that is more than uh, two people, two or more people contributing to that profile. So um, to give an example, like I said before, you get half your DNA from your mom and half your DNA from your dad. So if your mom gives you one type and your dad gives you that same type, you might only have that one type represented at any specific test site. If your mom gives you one type and your dad gives you a different type, you would have two different types at that test site. So if there's ever evidence of three or more types at a particular site, that's evidence that it's more than coming from more than one person. Are you familiar with the term trace DNA? Yes. What is trace DNA? Trace DNA is DNA that um, is left behind when it um, comes in contact with a person or an object. Is it possible to touch something or come in contact with something and your DNA not be detected during testing? Yes, that is possible. Um, it depends on how long you touch something, how hard you touch something, what the substrate is, um, and how much DNA can get left behind. What is primary transfer? Primary transfer of DNA is when you transfer DNA from a person to an object or a person to person. What is secondary transfer? Secondary DNA transfer is when DNA can be transferred from a person to a person to an object, from a person to an object to a person, from a person to an object to an object. Oh, I said that one already. But yeah, those are some examples. And in doing your analysis, you reach certain conclusions, is that correct? Yes, but after we make a comparison between the evidence and a known profile, we would have a conclusion, correct? I'd like to talk to you about different conclusions and what those mean so that the jury is clear. When you reach the conclusion included, what does that mean? An included um, conclusion would mean that the types in the known profile are present in the evidentiary profile where there are results. What does the conclusion cannot be eliminated mean? Cannot be eliminated is a conclusion where you have a partial match between the known types and the evidence where results are detected. What does the conclusion eliminated mean? Eliminated is when the known types are not present. It, some of them or all of them are not present in that evidentiary profile. What does your conclusion consistent with source mean? Consistent with source is when the, the known types are present in a single source profile at where uh, results are obtained. And what does the conclusion consistent with contributor mean? Consistent with a contributor is also a um, conclusion where a person's types are present um, in a mixture profile where there's, where there's results. Are you familiar with the acronym STR? Yes. What does STR stand for? STR is the actual type of nuclear DNA testing that we do. It stands for short tandem repeats. And this is a um, type of DNA testing that is used throughout um, Connecticut and the world. And you are basically looking at um, length variant repeats. So at any particular site, like I was talking about before with the, the different types, those types are represented by a number. And that number is because of the number of repeats at that site. So you think of it as a um, train. And a train has, every train has a engine car and a caboose. But the number of train cars in between those are the repeats and the different lengths. So I may have 15 train cars in between, but you may have 16. So those are what we're looking at. Are you familiar with something known as STR mix? Yes. What is that? That is a software that is used to help the DNA analysts interpreting uh, the DNA profiles. Are you familiar with the term likelihood ratio? Yes. What is that? The likelihood ratio is the evaluation of the weight of the evidence under alternate hypothesis. So that's the statistical weight that we give to a conclusion that is at a positive association. So you have some kind of weight to what that conclusion means. 
At the laboratory itself, what types of steps do you take to ensure there's no um, contamination from sample to sample? Sure, we always wear um, lab coats, masks, gloves, hair nets, um, when we're processing uh, samples in the laboratory. We use bleach and UV light to clean our surfaces. And we uh, have separate uh, testing spaces for our known profiles versus our question samples. When a case gets assigned to the laboratory, does it get a particular case number? Yes. I want to direct your attention now to a laboratory case number entitled DSS-19-002984. Did you conduct DNA analysis under this laboratory case number? Yes, I did. And was this laboratory case number associated with the New Canaan State Police investigation into the disappearance of Jennifer Dulos? Yes, it was. And in terms of doing DNA analysis, what do you need as a forensic scientist to do a comparison between a particular person and a DNA profile found on a piece of evidence? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. So how do you do a comparison between a particular person and an item and a DNA profile that you find on an item of evidence? Well, you have to develop a DNA profile for both of those. You need a known sample from that individual or person that you want to compare the evidence to. You mentioned a known sample. What is a known sample? A known DNA sample is a sample taken directly from a person that you know it's coming from, that source. Typically uh, swabbing up the inside of your cheeks, cheek swab. Are you familiar with the term pseudonome? Yes. What is a pseudonome sample? A pseudonome sample is a sample that's typically a piece of evidence that you gather from um, a person that you think their profile would be on and it would be a single source because you can't collect a buckle swab from that person. So a good example of this would be a toothbrush. You're only, you should be the only person on your toothbrush um, and then we could develop a DNA profile from that to use for comparison. In connection with this particular case, did you receive known DNA samples from several individuals? I did. And perhaps I'll just read them. Did you receive known DNA samples from Fotis Dulos, Michelle Traconis, Lauren Almeida, Howell Gumieni, Petros Dulos, Theodore Dulos, Christiane Dulos, Constantine Dulos, and Noel Dulos? I did. Now, when a known DNA sample is processed at the laboratory, who typically processes that sample? Typically, the knowns are done in a separate section of the lab. Um, to keep them separate from the evidence, and um, we have a separate section of people who process those knowns. I actually processed the um, two from Fotis, Dulos, and Michelle Traconis myself because I believe it was a sample that needed to be processed quickly, so I did them by myself and didn't wait for someone in the known section to do them. So essentially, the ordinary process is a known DNA sample is um, extracted by someone else in the laboratory and then you ordinarily review that data and compare it to the samples found on the evidence. Is that correct? Correct. Yes, it's done in a different part of the lab. It goes through the same process. It's um, analyzed, it's reviewed, and then that final profile is given to me so I can use it in comparison to the evidentiary profiles that I have. You mentioned in this case that you personally did the extraction for the known DNA samples of Fotis Dulos and Michelle Traconis. Is that correct? I did, yes. Did you um, do any other uh, extractions of what would be considered a pseudo known sample? I did. I processed the toothbrush. Were you able to generate a DNA profile from the toothbrush? I did. Your Honor, perhaps this would be an appropriate time to present the stipulation. Yes. This has been uh, marked as States Exhibit 27 and 28. <coughs> 27 is entitled a stipulation regarding evidence seized from 69 Wells Lane in a 2014 Range Rover. 
And State's Exhibit 28 is entitled Stipulation Regarding Evidence Seized from Jennifer Delos' Chevy Suburban. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, what the state and the uh, defense have agreed upon is contained in what is called a stipulation. It is signed by both parties. A stipulation is an agreement as to certain facts. So you will have an opportunity at the appropriate time to review those stipulations. Again, those stipulations concern an agreement between the state and the defense as to certain facts. Do you wish to publish it now or no? I'll publish it as we uh, proceed with the director on it. Thank you. Are you familiar with something known as a parentage analysis? Yeah, a parentage um, comparison is when we compare to see if a parent can be the possible um, can be the possible donor to that child's DNA. So we do a comparison and then a statistic to say, to show the frequency of people who could be a parent to that child. And did you um, do a parentage analysis in this particular case? I did. I compared the toothbrush to one of the uh, ch Dulos children. If I could just approach. Thank you. Can I just look at it quickly, please? I agree with Your Honor, I think State's Exhibit 29 can become a full exhibit. State's 29 admitted as a full exhibit. Can you use State's Exhibit 29? Um, indicated that you had done an analysis of the profile that you obtained from the toothbrush to Petros Dulos. Is that correct? Yes, this is the report I generated with that comparison. And can you tell the jury what your conclusion was? My conclusion was the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush is consistent with being a parent of Petros Dulos. The expected frequency of individuals who could be a parent of Petros Dulos is less than one in 8.1 billion in the general population. Now, when evidence comes to the state laboratory, is it given a submission number? Yes, when a submitting agency brings any evidence to the lab, it's given a unique case number, which we discuss is this DSS 19-002984, and then each piece of evidence is then given a number underneath that case number. And what was the submission number for the toothbrush in this case? Submission number seven. Now, Ordinarily, if there is swabs taken by a 
police department and submitted to the state laboratory for further forensic analysis, where's the first stop for those swabs? If there's just a DNA request, those swabs would go to uh, the forensic biology unit where they would prep those swabs for the DNA unit. So the person would just basically cut the swab, cotton swabs off the tip and put them in a tube for DNA. And are you familiar with someone named Christine Roy? I am. She's a, a forensic scientist in the forensic biology unit. And she has since retired, is that correct? That is correct. Um, but she did most of the uh, cutting in this particular case, is that correct? From what I recall, yes. And when a swab is cut off by forensic biology and submitted for DNA analysis, does that get an additional submission number? Yes, it gets what we call itemized. So if the parent item is uh, number one, then when they cut that swab off, they'll designate it as either a 1-1 or a 1-S1. Since it's been five years, the evidence nomenclature has changed a little bit, but it gets a sub-item of that parent item. And many of these um, swabs that were submitted were um, described by the state police as being KM positive. Are you familiar with that term? Yes. What does that stand for? KM is a, Castlemeyer, um, is a chemical screening test for the presence of blood in the sample. Many of these swabs, though, were not tested at the laboratory for confirmatory blood. Is that correct? That is correct. And some actually were tested additionally by the laboratory and came back negative. Is that correct? Um, for con confirmatory testing or KM? Um, I believe for KM. Uh, there might be some results in here that we did do KM testing on some samples. I can't recall exactly, but. OK. And if I just have a moment to refill them. And uh, just, to, just to be clear, most of these um, swabs were not confirmatory tested for blood either. Is that correct? Correct. Confirmatory test would be a separate test than KM. KM is a screening test. Now, you've indicated that you did um, analysis in this case. Is that right? Yes. Okay. I'd like to um, talk to you about some of the uh, results, if I could. I think I just pulled out the first one. Just give me a second. Your Honor, I'm publishing on the screen photograph which is found in States Exhibit 9, Folder 3, specifically Photograph 2. And I'm just going to publish the stipulation at this point. State Police Exhibit 9 was seized from 69 Wells Lane by Detective Riley on May 25, 2019 and identified as two swabs from the scene, exterior handles of the mudroom back door, and was subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as Submission Number 2. And Ms. Maydell, just for your benefit, this is referred to in DNA SUP 1, SUP 9, and SUP 18. Could you tell the jury um, what your conclusions were with respect to submission number 2? Sure. So for... The first report that it was reported in is Supplemental DNA Report, and it is uh, item 2S1 was the swabs from, quote, exterior handles of a mud mudroom back door. The results are consistent with a DNA profile from item 2S1 being a mixture of two contributors with at least one of them being male. 
Assuming two contributors, given the low likelihood ratios calculated, the results are inconclusive as to whether the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush could be a contributor to the DNA profile from item 2S1. Maybe could we request that you speak a little bit slower? Sorry. <coughs> Assuming two contributors, given the low likelihood ratios calculated, the results are inconclusive as to whether Fotis Dulos could be a contributor to the DNA profile from item 2S1. And what about the defendant? Michelle Traconis is eliminated as a contributor to the DNA profile from item 2S1. And could, could we have a sidebar for a moment, Your Honor? Yes. from that calculation is above what our elimination range is, but below what our positive association is. So therefore, we cannot reach a conclusion for that particular comparison. And eliminated? Eliminated is when the likelihood ratio is below our positive association, so we eliminate them, a negative likelihood ratio. And just staying with lab submission 2S1 specifically, is clear to the jury. Just using a narrative form, uh, Ms. Maydell, inconclusive means you can't tell, correct? Correct, I can't eliminate and I can't do a positive association. There's no, no conclusion can be made for that particular comparison. Thank you. 
So are there any questions based on the court's question? No, Judge. Thank you. Staying with uh, item 2S1, directing your attention at DNA sub supplemental report number nine. Did you do additional um, analysis with known profiles? Yes, I made a big one, sorry. That's what I know it's a lot. So the conclusion I made in this uh, report was two different knowns. So the conclusion is the same as the results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 2S1 being a mixture of two contributors with at least one of them being male. Assuming two contributors, given the low likelihood ratios calculated, the results are inconclusive whether Petros Dulos, Constantine Dulos, Christian Dulos, C. Noel Dulos, or Theodore Dulos could be contributors to the DNA profile from item 2S1. The results do not support the hypothesis that Lauren Almeida is a contributor to this profile. Assuming two contributors, Lauren Almeida is eliminated as a contributor to the DNA profile from item 2S1. And also pa Pavel Gumeni is eliminated as a contributor to the profile from 2S1. This is paragraph two of State's Exhibit 27. State Police Exhibit 10, which was um, seized by Detective Matthew Wiley from 69 Wells Lane on May 25th, 2019, and identified as two swabs from the scene the interior handles of the mudroom back door was subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission number three. And this is in DNA Supplemental Report number one. Can you tell the jury what the results of your analysis were for that particular item? Um, do I have, it's supposed to be six of it, number 27, you said? Uh, Ms. Maydell, it'll be DNA Supplemental Report number one, which is in front of you. State's Exhibit 27 is the stipulation that I made. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um. It was lab item number one? Uh, lab submission number three. Three. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Found it. Um, that was bag with two swabs, and the sub item was called swabs from quote, interior handles of mudroom back door. And what were the results? For item 3S1, there was no DNA profile detected. What does that mean when no DNA profile is detected? There just was not enough um, DNA there to detect a profile, so I have no results. Publishing to the jury, Your Honor, photograph contained in State's Exhibit 9, Folder 3. This is photograph number 18, and it displays the garage door opener at 69 Wells Lane. This was identified as State Police Exhibit 11. Two swabs of the exterior garage door opener open keypad from the center bay and was subsequently designated as lab submission number 63. And I'm just reading from paragraph three of our stipulation. And if you could read a little slower, please, Attorney McGinnis. I'm sorry. I apologize, Your Honor. It was uh, designated submission number 63. And for your benefit, Ms. Maydell, it's found in DNA supplemental reports number two, nine, and 18. Was this given a sub item as well? Yes, so 63S1 is that it was a designated swabs from quote garage door opener keypad. And what were the results of the swabs from the garage door opener keypad? It 
The results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 63S1 being a mixture of two contributors. The results do not support the hypothesis that the source of the DNA from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush, Photos Dulos, or Michelle, Contro Michelle Traconis are contributors to this profile. Assuming two contributors, the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the toothbrush, Photos Dulos, and Michelle Traconis are eliminated as contributors to the DNA profile from item 63S1. And you did additional analysis in DNA supplemental number nine with known profiles, is that correct? Correct. And what were the results after you had a chance to look at the other known profiles? The results are consistent with the DNA profile from 63S1 being a mixture of two contributors. Assuming two contributors, the DNA profile from item 63S1 is at least 45,000 times more likely to occur if it originated from Lauren Almeida and one unknown individual than if it originated from two unknown individuals. The results do not support the hypothesis that C. Noel Dulos is a contributor to this profile. Assuming two contributors, C. Noel Dulos is eliminated as a contributor to the DNA profile from 63S1. Petros Dulos, Constantine Dulos, Christian Dulos, Theodore Dulos, and Pavel Gumini are eliminated as contributors to the DNA profile from item 63S1. And just to sort of short circuit this, uh, going forward, if the, with the court's permission, if, if the other children are eliminated, you can just say the other Dulos children or okay. um, just to sort of streamline it. Sure. Um, I'm uh, displaying for the court now State's Exhibit 9, folder number 2, picture 7, which shows um, the mud door handles, Your Honor. And with respect to the stipulation, it's agreed that this is State Police Exhibit 12. It was seized by Detective Riley and submitted to the State Forensic Laboratory as submission number 4. I'd like to talk to you about this um, DNA submission, if I could. Um, we're swabbings taken of this particular object? Yes. And um, unlike some of the other objects where the swabs came in from the police department, Miss Roy actually did these swabs, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And how many swabs did she take in total? On my supplemental DNA report, I have two, 4-1S1 and 4-1S2. All right, um, and uh, I'd also, um, direct you to DNA sub 2, I believe there's also 4-1S3. Correct, yes. 4-1S4, so there were four swabs total taken of these? Yes. Okay. Just beginning with the first swab, 4-1S1, um, what were the results for that swab? And this will be in DNA sub 1 and sub 9. The results are consistent. Oh, the 4-1-S1 was designated a reddish-brown ridge-like detail from front of knob. The results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 4-1-S1 being a mixture of two contributors. Assuming two contributors, given the low likelihood ratios calculated, the results are inconclusive as to whether the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush could be a contributor to the DNA profile from item 4-1-S1. The results do not support the hypothesis that Photos Dulos is a contributor to this profile. Assuming two contributors, Photos Dulos is eliminated as a contributor to the DNA profile from item 4-1-S1. Michelle Draconis is eliminated as a contributor to the DNA profile from item 4-1-S1. And when you did the additional analysis of the names in DNA sub-9, what were the results? The results are consistent with the DNA profile from item, oh sorry, I'm on the wrong one. For 1S1 being a mixture of two contributors. Assuming two contributors, given the low likelihood ratios calculated, the results are inconclusive as to whether 
Constantine Dulos could be a contributor to the DNA profile from item 4-1-S1. The results do not support the hypothesis that Christine Dulos is a contributor. So assuming two contributors, Christine Dulos is eliminated. Results do not support the hypothesis that C. Noel Dulos is a contributor. Assuming two contributors, C. Noel Dulos is eliminated as a contributor for, to 4 one s one And then Petros Dulos, Theodore Dulos, Lauren Almeida, and Paul Pavel Gumini are eliminated as contributors to the DNA profile from 4 one s one and just with respect to 41S2, which was found in DNA sub 1, no profile was obtained. Is that correct? That is correct. And with respect to um, 41S3, was that a swabbing of a doorknob and plate assembly with screws? Yes, that's what it was designated. And um, directing your attention now to DNA sub 2, what were the results? The results of, are consistent with the DNA profile from item 4, 1S3, being a mixture of three contributors with at least one of them being male. Assuming three contributors, the DNA profile from item 4-1S3 is at least 100 billion times more likely to occur if it originated from the source of the DNA profile of the swabbing of the electric toothbrush and two unknown individuals than if it originated from three unknown individuals. Assuming three contributors, the DNA profile from item 4-1S3 is at least 330,000 times more likely to occur if it originated from photos doulos and two unknown individuals than if it originated from three unknown individuals. And Michelle Traconis is eliminated as a contributor to the DNA profile from item 4-1S3. Well, uh, Attorney McGinnis, what the court is going to do is just ask a few questions so that it is clear what those numbers mean, but in a more narrative form. So, Ms. Maydell, when you indicated that uh, certain, uh, court is going to refer to it as likelihoods occur, when you use the numbers, uh, would you explain in a, in a narrative form, what those numbers mean. So if someone is 45,000 times more likely to be X, what does that mean? Well, it's, it's a, a likelihood ratio that, given the evidence, the evidence is more likely to occur if hypothesis one is true compared to hypothesis two. So would you rephrase it using those numbers. So for any the given evidence, it would be 100 times more likely, 100 billion times more likely as an example, for hypothesis one to be true compared to what hypothesis two is. So it's a comparison of the hypotheses. Yes, only one of them can be true. So if that evidence is more likely to occur if the first hypothesis is true compared to the second hypothesis. Thank you. I believe you indicated for 4-1-S-3, it was 330,000 times more likely that Fotis Dulos was a contributor to the profile than if it were three unknown people. Is that correct? 330,000 times, yes. And, and I'll just note, I think that's a misstatement of what the odds are. I, I think this is a... They call the fallacy. It is odds of one thing occurring versus another, not that it's that person. Well, what the court uh, understood from Ms. Maydell's explanation is that we are comparing hypotheses. We're not talking about identification. And just directing your attention to DNA Supplemental Report Number 9, we again um, ran those additional names against the DNA profile from 4 
1S3. And if you're ready, what were the results? Sure. The results are consistent with the DNA profile from four 1S3 being a mixture of three contributors with at least one of them being male. The source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush is assumed to be a contributor to the DNA profile from item four 1S3. Assuming three contributors where the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the toothbrush is one of the contributors, the DNA profile from item four 1S3 is at least 900,000 times more likely to occur if it originated from Fotis Dulos, the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush, and one known, unknown individual than if it originated from the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush and two unknown individuals. Assuming three contributors, where the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush is is one of the contributors, the DNA profile from item 4, 1S3, is at least 160,000 more times likely to occur if it originated from Petros Dulos, the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the toothbrush, and one unknown individual than if it originated from the source of the toothbrush and two unknown individuals. Assuming three contributors, where the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush is one of the contributors, the DNA profile from item 41S3 is at least 30,000 times more likely to occur if it originated from C. Noel Dulos, the source of the DNA profile from the tooth electric toothbrush, and one unknown individual than if it originated from the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush and two unknown individuals. Assuming three contributors where the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush is one of the contributors, given the low likelihood ratios calculated, the results are inconclusive as to whether Constantine Dulos, Christian Dulos, Theodore Dulos, and Pavel Gumeni could be contributors to the DNA profile from item 41S3. Lauren Almeida is eliminated as a contributor to the DNA profile from item 41S3. I want to talk to you about 41S3 for a second. For in DNA Supplemental 9, you assume that the profile from the toothbrush was a contributor. What it, can you just explain to the jury when you assume that a particular profile is a contributor to another profile? What does that mean? So um, it's called conditioning. And when there's a scientific, um, reasonable expectation scientifically that a person's DNA could be on that item, it is sometimes better to assume that person so you can get a more accurate likelihood ratio to the other contributors that are um, contributing to that DNA profile. So after I did the first report where I compared the toothbrush and FOTUS to the um, swabbing of the doorknob and plate and saw that they were both contributors, knowing that I'm going to now compare the children to that profile, because the children get half their DNA from their mother and half their DNA from their father, it's a given that those profiles are going to be there because if they're contributing, then it's the children are gonna have a likelihood ratio. So in order to give a more accurate um, likelihood ratio to if the children, are, um, the children are contributing to that profile, we went and assumed the toothbrush because she's scientifically um, expected to be on that um, doorknob because that is her house. The time is now 11.15. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we will take our morning recess. The court should indicate to you today that we will conclude today's session at 3 o'clock. So we ask that you uh, retire to the uh, deliberation room and please do not discuss the case. We'll resume at uh, 11.30. All right. This Honorable Superior Court now is going to be resumed.
Please be seated. <clears throat> Before the jury comes out, I would just note um, that we had a sidebar. Um, there was a previous motion uh, regarding um, motion in limine regarding the, the question about what did it inconclusive mean. Um, it was clarified by the state, but the state started getting into it knowing that there was a motion in limine again. The court did some clarification, and, and as far as I'm concerned, that was fine. But I, again, I would ask the, the state to, to realize that if I file a motion in limine, it's because there's an issue that should be resolved so we don't have to do sidebar and it doesn't require the court's <coughs> intervention. Maybe he was inadvertent on Mr. McGinnis's car part. I'm just um, raising it because we have a moment to do so. Thank you. Well, the record has to reflect that the court did act on the motion. Um, the motion is denied, uh, but that uh, <coughs> denial in this court's view is not to the prejudice of the defense because the court has the opportunity to ask questions uh, which would uh, allow the jury not to be confused for example, the, uh, and this goes back to yesterday's discussion, the likelihood ratio. The likelihood ratio is a simply a, a ratio of compared hypotheses. And so if the jury did not understand that previously, hopefully the jury understands that now. Are we ready to proceed? Yes, sir. Thank you. We can bring the jury back in, please. Will counsel stipulate? Yes, Judge. Yes. Okay, thank you. Attorney McGinnis. Good morning again. Ms. Mandel, I just wanted to ask you, when we were talking about hypotheses earlier, hypothesis one versus hypothesis two, uh, could you just explain to the jury a little, in a little more detail what that means from, from your perspective? Does it mean it's one or the other? What, what exactly does that mean? When we're creating these hypotheses, it's to describe how likely the evidence is to occur. Is it to more likely to occur when hypotheses one is true compared to hypotheses two? So it's not an either or scenario. No, it's if, if number one is true compared to what number two is. Were there a number of um, results in this case in which you concluded that the contributor to the profile was a single female individual and that it was 100 billion more times more likely to be the profile on the toothbrush and everyone else was eliminated? Yes, there is a bunch of those samples. All right, I'd like to talk to you about those if I could. If we can call up uh, Exhibit 15 or a photograph of State Police Exhibit 15, which is found in State Trial Exhibit 9, folder number 3, photograph 13. And just for the record, Your Honor, State Police Exhibit 15 was identified as two swabs of a blood-like same seized from the scene, the handle under the sink cabinet door, Kitchen Island, and subsequently designated as Submission 6. Were these um, results <coughs> consistent with being a single female and the results being 100 billion times more likely to be the profile found on the toothbrush? Yes. If we can call up 
State Police Exhibit 35, which was identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain, G19, seized from the scene and submitted to the lab as submission 102. Were these the uh, same results being a single female, 100 billion times more likely to result if it was the DNA profile obtained from the toothbrush as opposed to an unknown individual? Yes, single female individual, yes. We can call State Police Exhibit number 36. This was identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain, G20, seized from the scene, and subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services as submission 103. Same results. And that's uh, DNA sub-7 and sub-10. Yep. Uh, yes. Staying with DNA sub 7 and 10 for your benefit, Ms. Mandel, if we can call up State Police Exhibit number 36, excuse me, uh, 37. And this was identified <laughs> as two swabs of a blood-like stain C2, KM positive, seized from the scene, subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 104. Was it the same result, Ms. Maydell? Yes. We can call up State Police Exhibit 38, photograph of that. And this was identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain, B3, seized from the scene, North Bay, and submitted to the state lab as submission number 105. Were the results the same, a single female? Yes. <laughs> and just to be clear, a single female, 100 billion times more likely to be the profile obtained from the toothbrush, is that correct? Correct. And everyone else was eliminated? Correct. If we can call up a photograph of State Police Exhibit number 39. This was identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain, B11, seized from the scene, KM positive, North Bay, subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services as submission 106. What were the results of this? The same as the previous results. Single female, assuming one individual, the DNA profile from item 106S1 is 100 billion times more likely to occur if it originated from the source of the DNA profile from the source. Right. Assuming one individual, the DNA profile from item 101S1 is at least 100 billion times more likely to occur if it originated from the source of the DNA profile from a swabbing of the electric toothbrush than if it originated from an unknown individual. We can call up State Police Exhibit number 41. Photograph of that. Well, Your Honor, I, I note that the witness uh, skipped the last sentence of her, report, of her finding on that particular item. I just ask that you read the remaining sentence. Well, um, Attorney McGinnis, is there another sentence that was not read from the conclusion? I'm unclear, Judge. I'm assuming he's referring to everyone being eliminated. Everyone else being the eliminated? The court does not know yeah. because the court yeah. does not have the That's exhibit. Good. So the, these results that we're going through now are consistent with the profile of the uh, that you obtained from the toothbrush being 100 billion times more likely to be the source of these profiles. Is that correct? Versus an unknown profile. Right. And everyone else has been eliminated. These results are all the same, correct? Correct, so far. <clears throat> we can call up a photograph of State Police Exhibit 41. This was identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain, A18, KM positive, seized from the scene, and subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as item 108. Um, were these results the same as your previous answer? Yes. We could call up State Police Exhibit number 45.
this was identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain, KM positive, seized from the scene, Center Bay, subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 109. Is the uh, results of this uh, test the same? Yes. If we could call up State Police number 48. This was identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain, KM positive, seized from the scene, Center Bay, subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 112. Were the results here the same? Yes. If we could call up State Police Exhibit 59. This was identified as uh, two swabs of a blood-like stain, KM positive, seized from the scene, garage 2014 Land Rover, left side of the hood, subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 118. Were the results of this the same? Yes. We could call up exhibit 60. This was identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain, KM positive, seized from the scene, garage, 2014 Land Rover, left front corner of bumper, subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services as submission 119. Were the results here the same? Yes. If we could call up State Police Photograph 61. This was identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain, KM positive, seized from the scene, garage, 2014, Land Rover, exterior side of left front door, subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission eight. Um, were the results of the analysis here the same? And that's in uh, DNA sup one and sup nine. Yes. We can call up State Police Exhibit 62. This was identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain, KM positive, seized from the garage, 2014 Land Rover, exterior side, left rear door, subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 121. Were the results of this test the same? Yes. We can call up State Police Exhibit 63. This was identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain, KM positive, seized from the scene, 2014 Land Rover, left rear fender, subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 120. Were the results of this test the same? Yes. We can call up State Police Exhibit 64. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't think we have a photograph of 64. State Police Exhibit 64 was identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain, KM positive, seized from the scene, east wall of garage, north of door to mudroom. Were the results of that test the same? So what item number for the lab? Oh, I apologize. Um, submission 120. 22? Yes. <clears throat> we can call up State Police Exhibit 65. This was identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain, KM positive, seized from the scene, south side of garage, top corner of garbage can western, subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 9. Were the results of this test the same? <coughs> And that's in DNA SUP 1 and SUP 9. Yes. <clears throat> if we can call up State Police Exhibit 66.
This was identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain, KM positive, seized from the scene, south side of garage, top corner of garbage can Eastern, and subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 123. Were the results of this test the same? Yes. <clears throat> if we can call up State Police Exhibit 78. This was identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain, KM positive, seized from the scene, kitchen island countertop edge north of sink, subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 10. Were the results of this test the same? Yes. <clears throat> if we can call up exhibit, State Police Exhibit 320. This was identified as suspected biological matter E, seized from uh, the scene, garage 2014 Land Rover, lower edge, left front door, subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific, Scientific Services and designated as submission 132. Um, were the results of this test the same? Yes. We can return to um, State Police Exhibit uh, number 13. I don't know if I talked about this one yet. <clears throat> this was identified as one used paper towel roll with blood like stains, KM positive, seized from the scene, kitchen island countertop, east of sink, and subsequently submitted as. Submission 101, um, were the results of this the same? This is from DNA sub 7 and 10. You said number 110? Uh, 101. 101. Correct, yes. Okay. <clears throat> if we could call up uh, State Police Exhibit 14. This was identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain, KM positive, seized from the scene, kitchen sink, faucet spout, and subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission five. Um, can you uh, let us know what the results were of this? This is from DNA SUP one and nine. <clears throat> the results are consistent with the DNA profile from item five S one being a mixture of two contributors with at least one of them being male. Assuming two contributors, the DNA profile from item 5S1 is at least 100 billion times more likely to occur if it originated from the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush and one unknown individual than if it originated from two unknown individuals. Assuming two contributors, the DNA profile from item 5S1 is at least 4.3 billion times more likely to occur if it originated from Fotis Dulos and one unknown individual than if it originated from two unknown individuals. Michelle Traconis is eliminated as a contributor to the DNA profile from item 5S1. And directing your attention now to DNA supplemental report number nine, um, did you reanalyze this profile and assume that the profile from the toothbrush was a contributor? Yes, again, knowing um, from this first report that it was a two-person mixture and it looked like a mixture of the parents of the children, I went and 
created a new hypothesis to make that second contributor uh, more discriminating. So I ran the children all against that first deconvolution of the two-person mixture in order to determine who had the highest likelihood ratio um, between the toothbrush and the five children. So then I could then assume one of them and make a comparison to that second person. So after I did that, the toothbrush had the highest likelihood ratio as being a contributor. And when you assume somebody on a um, profile, it increases the likelihood ratios of true contributors, but it will decrease the likelihood ratio of non-contributors. So it is a scientifically sound um, conclusion to do. So after I did that, then I made my conclusions in Supplemental 9. And what were the conclusions? The results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 5S1 being a mixture of two contributors with one of them being male. The source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush is assumed to be a contributor to the DNA profile from item 5S1. Assuming two contributors, where the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush is one of the contributors, the DNA profile from 5S1 is at least 100 billion times more likely to occur if it originated from photos doulos and the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush than if it originated from the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush and one unknown individual. Petros Doulos, Constantine Doulos, Christiane Doulos, C. Noel Dulos, Theodore Dulos, Laura Almeida, and Paul, Paul Pavel Gumini are eliminated as contributors to the DNA profile from 5S1. <clears throat> so all the other known profiles that you had, including the defendant, were eliminated. Is that correct? Yes. After I assume the toothbrush as a contributor to the profile, the children are eliminated and cannot be the second contributor. If we can call up um, State Police Exhibit 40. And this was identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain, A15, KM positive, seized from the scene, North Bay, subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services as submission 107. And this is found in DNA Supplemental Reports 7 and 10 for your benefit, Ms. Maydell. What were the results of the analysis here? One oh seven S one, you said? Yes. The results are consistent with the DNA profile from item one oh seven S one being a mixture of two contributors. Assuming two contributors, the DNA profile from item one oh seven S one is at least a hundred billion times more likely to occur if it originated from the source of the DNA problem profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush and one unknown individual than if it originated from two unknown individuals. Due to the limited data detected from item 107, S1, the comparison to Fotis Dulos and Michelle Traconis are inconclusive. What does that mean when you say due to limited data? So this is, um, was designated a two-person mixture. So the major profile being the, it, so I probably had a major profile with a minor profile. So looking at the toothbrushes being 100 billion times more likely, that was the major profile in the, um, within that two person. And there was only one, probably, I don't want to speak without seeing the actual data, one peak that wasn't attributed from that DNA profile from the toothbrush. And Fotis Dulos and Michelle Traconis have that peak, so I can't say conclusively if they're a contributor or not, but I can't eliminate them either. If we can call up State Police Exhibit 42. This was identified as a fragment of a paper towel with a blood-like stain and subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as item 65 or submission 65, I should say. And for your benefit, Ms. Maydell, this is found in DNA SUP reports 3 and 9.
I'm sorry, can you repeat the number? 65. 65. <clears throat> the results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 65S1 being a mixture of two contributors. Assuming two contributors, the DNA profile from item 65S1 is at least 2.5 billion times more likely to occur if it originated from the source of the DNA profile from a swabbing of the electric toothbrush and one unknown individual than if it originated from two unknown individuals. Fotis Dulos and Michelle Chaconis are eliminated as contributors to the DNA profile from item 65 S1. And in fact, all known other profiles were eliminated. Is that correct? Let me just double check. What was the other report? Sub 9. Sub 9. <coughs> and I'm going to object to this mischaracterization. If I may just have a moment. Oh, I apologize. <laughs> Well, sustained. I apologize, Your Honor. If you could just read the results when you compared it to the other knowns. Sure. <clears throat> the results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 65S1 being a mixture of two contributors. Assuming two contributors, given the low likelihood ratios calculated, the results are inconclusive whether Theodore Dulos could be a contributor to the DNA profile from 65S1. The other children, Lauren Almeida, Pavel, Gumini, are all eliminated as contributors to 65S1. If we can call up State Police Exhibit 43. And this was identified as a fragment of a paper towel with a blood-like stain and submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 66, and this can be found in DNA reports three and nine. The results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 66S1 being a mixture of two contributors. Assuming two contributors, the DNA profile from item 66S1 is at least 100 billion times more likely to occur if it originated from the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush and one unknown individual than if it originated from two unknown individuals. Fotis Dulos and Michelle Traconis are eliminated as contributors to the DNA profile from 66S1. And was there um, additional swabbing of the paper towel that was designated as 66S2? I'm sorry. S. Yeah, there was a 66 S2 and 66 S3. Okay. So can you just uh, indicate to the results of 66 S2, which was identified as swabbing of paper towel side A? There was no DNA profile detected. And similarly, the results for 66 S3, the swabbing of the paper towel side B? No DNA profile detected. If we can call up State Police Exhibit 44. I didn't do the results for 66S1 against the children. Oh, I apologize. Okay. If I could just have a moment. Yes, if you could tell us the results of 66S1. So the results are consistent with the DNA profile from 66S1 being a mixture of two contributors. Assuming two contributors, given the low likelihood ratios calculated, <clears throat> the results are inconclusive as to whether Petros Dulos, Constantine Dulos, Christiane Dulos, C. Noel Dulos, or Theodore Dulos could be contributors to the DNA profile from 66S1. Lauren Almeida and Pavel Gumini are eliminated as contributors to the profile from 66S1. And if we could bring up State Police Exhibit 44. This was identified as a fragment of a paper towel with a blood-like stain and subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as item 
submission number 67. And uh, there were actually two separate um, analysis of this particular item. There was a fragment of the paper towel and then there was a swabbing of the paper towel. Is that correct? Yes, 67S1 and 67S2. Okay, so let's start with 67S1, which was actually a fragment of the paper towel. Um, what were the results for that? <clears throat> the results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 67S1 originating from a single female individual. Assuming one individual, the DNA profile from 67S1 is at least 1 billion times more likely to occur if it originated from the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush than if it originated from an unknown individual. Fotis Dulos and Michelle Traconis are eliminated as the source of 67S1. And I'm um, directing your attention now to supplemental report number nine. Um, the Dulos children, as well as Lauren Almeida and Pavel Gloomy, were also eliminated. Is that correct? Correct. And what were the results of 67S2, which was a swabbing of a paper, this paper towel fragment? No DNA profile was detected. If we can call up state police. Um, actually, I don't, I don't believe we have a photograph of 46, but state police 46 is identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain KM positive seized from the scene North Bay, subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 110. And for your benefit, Ms. Maydell, it's found in DNA supplemental reports number seven and 10. Could you indicate to the jury what the results were? The results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 110S1 <coughs> originating from a single individual. Assuming one individual, Given the low likelihood ratios calculated, the results are inconclusive as to whether the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush could be the source of the DNA profile from item 110S1. Fotis Dulos and Michelle Traconis are eliminated as the source of the DNA profile from item 110S1. And then when you had an opportunity to test that profile against additional knowns in DNA Supplemental Report 10, what was your conclusion? <clears throat> the results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 110S1 originating from a single individual. Assuming one individual, given the low likelihood ratios calculated, the results are inconclusive as to whether Petros Dulos Constantine Dulos, Christian Dulos, C. Noel Dulos, or Theodore Dulos could be the source of the DNA profile from item 110S1. Lauren Almeida and Pavel Gumini are eliminated as the source of the DNA profile from 110S1. We can call up State Police 47. This was identified as two swabs of a blood like stain. KM negative, seized from the scene, Center Bay, subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 111. And Ms. Maydell, for your benefit, these results are found in Supplemental Reports 7 and 10. The results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 111S1, originating from a single individual. The source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush is eliminated as the source of the DNA profile from item 111S1. Fotis Dulos and Michelle Traconis are also eliminated as the source of the DNA profile from item 111S1. And then when you did additional comparison to the other knowns in DNA Supplemental Report number 10? Assuming one individual, given the low likelihood ratios calculated, the results are inconclusive to whether Petros Dulos, Christian Dulos, or Theodore Dulos could be a source of the DNA profile from item 1S, 111S1. Constantine Dulos, C. Noel Dulos, Lauren Almeida, and Pavel Gumini are eliminated as the source of the DNA profile from item 111S1. If we can call up State Police number 49.
State Police number 49 was identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain, KM negative, seized from the scene center bay, subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 113. What were the results of this? No DNA profile was detected. If I could just have one moment with counsel. If we can call up State Police Exhibit 50. This is identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain, KM negative, seized from the scene center bay, subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 114. And this is uh, in DNA reports 7 and 10 for your benefit, Ms. Maydell. Um, could you just indicate to the jury what the results were here? <clears throat> The results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 114S1 being a mixture of two contributors with at least one of them being male. Assuming two contributors, given the low likelihood ratios calculated, the results are inconclusive as to whether the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush could be a contributor to the DNA profile from item 114S1. Fotis Dulos is eliminated as a contributor to the DNA profile from item 114S1. The results do not support the hypothesis that Michelle Traconis is a contributor to this profile. Assuming two contributors, Michelle Traconis is eliminated as a contributor to the DNA profile from item 114S1. And then when you did additional comparisons of the knowns in DNA supplemental report number 10, um, were all the other known profiles eliminated, the Dulos children, Lauren Almeida and Pavel Galimi? Correct, yes. If we could call up State Police number 51. State Police 51 is identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain KM positive seized from the scene South Bay, subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission number 115. And Ms. Maydell, this is also in reports 7 and 10. Um, can you indicate to the jury what the results were? The results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 115S1 being a mixture of three contributors, with at least one of them being male. Assuming three contributors, given the low likelihood ratios calculated, the results are inconclusive as to whether the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush could be a contributor to the DNA profile from item 115S1. The results do not support the hypothesis that Fotis Dulos or Michelle Traconis are contributors to this profile. Assuming three contributors, Fotis Dulos and Michelle Traconis are eliminated as contributors to the DNA profile from 115S1. And DNA supplemental report number 10, when you had the benefit of doing additional known comparison? Yes. The results are consistent with the DNA profile from 115S1 being a mixture of three contributors, with at least one of them being male. Petros Dulos. Konstantin Dulos, Christian Dulos, and Pavel Gumeni are eliminated as contributors to the profile from item 115S1. Assuming three contributors, given the low likelihood ratios calculated, the results are inconclusive as to whether C. Noel Dulos could be a contributor to the DNA profile from 115S1. And the results do not support the hypothesis that De Theodore Dulos or Laura Almeida are contributors to this profile. Assuming three contributors, Theodore Dulos and Lauren Almeida are eliminated as contributors to the DNA profile from 115S1. If we can call up state police number 52. This was identified as uh, two swabs of a blood-like stain, KM negative, seized from the scene South Bay, subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 116, what were the results of this? DNA sub seven. 
no DNA profile was detected. If we could call up state police number 53. <clears throat> This was identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain KM positive seized from the scene South Bay, subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 117. And again, this, these results can be found in seven and 10, Ms. Maydell. Yes. Would you just indicate to the jury uh, what the results were? The results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 117S1 being a mixture of two contributors Due to the limited data detected from 117S1, the comparison to the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing electric toothbrush and Michelle Traconis are inconclusive. Photos Dulos is eliminated as a contributor to the DNA profile from item 117S1. <clears throat> and then when you had the benefit of comparing additional knowns? The results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 117S1 being a mixture of two contributors. Petros Dulos, Constantine Dulos, Christiane Dulos, and Theodore Dulos are eliminated as a contributor to the DNA profile from item 117S1. Due to the limited data detected from 117S1, the comparisons to Sino El Dulos, Laura Almeida, and Pavel Gumeni are inconclusive. We could call up State Police 67. And this was identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain, KM positive, seized from the scene, interior side of North Garage door, and subsequently submitted to Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission number 68. And this is for your benefit, Ms. Maydell, can be found in DNA reports two and nine. Um, beginning with report two, what were your conclusions? So what was the number again, item number? 68. 68. The results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 68S1 being a mixture of two contributors. Assuming two contributors, the DNA, DNA profile from item 68S1 is at least 810 million times more likely to occur if it originated from the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush and one unknown, one unknown individual than if it originated from two unknown individuals. Fotis Dulos and Michelle Traconis are eliminated as contributors to the DNA profile from item 68S1. And now directing your attention to DNA supplemental report number nine when you did additional comparisons to knowns? The results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 68S1 being a mixture of two contributors Assuming two contributors, given the low likelihood ratios calculated, the results are inconclusive as to whether Petros Dulos, Constantine Dulos, Christiane Dulos, C. Noel Dulos, or Theodore Dulos could be contributors to the DNA profile from item 68S1. Lauren Almeida and Pavel Gumini are eliminated as contributors to the DNA profile from item 68S1. And if we can call up State Police 79. This was identified as a two swabs of a blood-like stain KM positive seized from the scene, the kitchen sink faucet handle, and subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 11. And this can be found in DNA Supplemental Report number one and nine, Ms. Maydell. The results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 11S1 originating from a single individual. Assuming one individual, given the low likelihood ratios calculated, the results are inconclusive as to whether the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush 
could be the source of the DNA profile from item 11S1. Fotis Dulos and Michelle Traconis are eliminated as the source of the DNA profile from item 11S1. And then directing your attention on DNA supplemental report number nine. You have the benefit of doing additional comparisons with knowns. Yes. Results are consistent with the profile from 11S1 originating from a single individual, assuming one individual, given the low likelihood ratios calculated, the results are inconclusive to whether Petros Dulos, Constantine Dulos, Christian Dulos, C. Noel Dulos, and Theodore Dulos could be the source of the DNA profile from 11S1. Lauren Almeida and Pavel Gumini are eliminated as the source of the DNA profile from 11S1. If we can call up State Police Exhibit 319. State Police 319 was identified as suspected biological matter D, seized from the scene, 2014 Land Rover, left front fender, and subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 131. Then directing your attention to DNA supplemental reports 7 and 10, could you indicate to the jury what the results were? So just, what was the number again? Um, 131. 31. Results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 131S1 originating from a single female individual. Assuming one individual, the DNA profile from item 131S1 is 100 billion times more likely to occur if it originated from the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush than if it originated from an unknown individual. And were photos Dulos and the defendant eliminated? Yes. And in DNA supplemental report number 10, were the um, Dulos children, Lauren Almeida and Pavel Gumi, eliminated as well? Yes, correct. If we could call up uh, just State Police Exhibit 12 for one moment. I think we've talked about the fact that there were four separate swabbings of this, and I think we got through 1S1 through 1S3. I wanted to just talk to you about the results of 1S4. And that's identified as the swabbing of a doorknob and plate assembly without screws. For 1S4? That's correct, ma'am. Okay. Um, and this is found in DNA subs 2 and 9 for your benefit, Ms. Maybell. Could you just indicate to the jury what the results were? <clears throat> the results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 4-1S4 being a mixture of four contributors with at least one of them being male. Assuming four contributors, the DNA profile from item 4-1S4 is at least one billion times more likely to occur if it originated from the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush and three unknown individuals than if it originated from four unknown individuals. The results do not support a hypothesis that Fotis Dulos is a contributor to this profile. Assuming four contributors, Fotis Dulos is eliminated as a contributor to the profile from item 4-1S4. Michelle Traconis is eliminated as a contributor to the DNA profile from item 4-1S4. And when you did the additional comparisons? Assuming four contributors, given the low likelihood ratios calculated, the results are inconclusive as to whether Petros Dulos, Constantine Dulos, 
C. Noel Dulos or Theodore Dulos could be contributors to the DNA profile from item 4, 1S4. Assuming four contributors, the DNA profile from item 4, 1S4 is at least 130 times, 130,000 times more likely to occur if it originated from Christiane Dulos and three unknown individuals than if it originated from four unknown individuals. Lauren Almeida and Pavel Gumini are eliminated as contributors to the DNA profile from item 4-1-S4. I'm now going to shift around. I'm going to be publishing things from um, States Exhibit 28, which is the stipulation regarding evidence seized from Jennifer Dulos' Chevy Suburban. Thank you. Um, Ms. Maydell, you recall um, approximately 45 minutes to an hour ago, we talked about results in which there was a single female contributor and it was 100 billion times more likely to have occurred if it was the profile from the, that you obtained from the toothbrush as opposed to an unknown individual. Do you recall that testimony? Yes. All right. And in those instances, everyone else, all the other knowns were eliminated. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. All right. I want to just direct your attention now if we can call up uh, State Police Exhibit 105. This is uh, identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain KM positive taken from the rear bumper step of a 2017 Chevrolet Suburban and subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as item 124. Um, were those the same results that we were uh, just discussing? This can be found in DNA Supplemental Report number 7 and 10. Yes, that is correct. And uh, if we can call 106. Same results. This, I'm sorry. Let me publish. Uh, this is uh, State Police Exhibit 106, identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain taken from the exterior side of the right rear door and submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission number 15. Were these the same results, Ms. Maydell? Which report is that? Oh, DNA Supplemental Report number 1 and 9. Fifteen S one, yes. And if we can call up State Police one hundred and seven. This is identified as two swabs of a blood like stain KM positive taken from the running board under the right front door and subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission. 100 and the steps. If I could just have one moment, Your Honor. If I could just have one moment, Attorney Sean. Sure. I apologize, I just had a Scrivener's error. State Police uh, 107 is identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain KM positive taken from the 
running board under the right front door, subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 125. With respect to this, um, are these the same results, meaning 100 billion times more likely to originate from the profile obtained from the electric toothbrush than an unknown profile, and all other known individuals to you were eliminated? Yes. If we could call up State Police Exhibit 120. <coughs> This is identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain, KM positive, taken from the left side of the cargo area and subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission number 70. Same results. Uh, DNA sub three and nine. We could call up state police number 316. <clears throat> this was identified as two swabs from area A, subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 100. I'm sorry? Oh, we don't have 316? Okay. Should I have a moment with counsel in front of you? A brief moment? May, may we just take a five minute uh, recess so I can get the defense uh, some paperwork? Yes. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please retire to the deliberation room and please do not discuss the case.
Please be seated. Thank you. Well, the court understands that the jury room is being provided air conditioning. <laughs> so, um, court Keep is just going to indicate to the jury that we will address that in about 15 minutes. We can bring the jury in. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, the court understands that it is quite cold in the deliberation room. So we will address that at the uh, lunch and recess. Uh, will counsel stipulate to the presence of all of the jurors? Yes, Judge. Yes. Thank you. You may proceed, counsel. Ms. Maydell, where we left off, we were discussing State Police Exhibit 316, um, which was seized from the Chevy Suburban and identified as two swabs from Area A and subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as Submission 128. For your benefit, this is DNA Reports 7 and 10. What were the results? Number 128 is the same as what we were previously talking about. Single, um, single female individual, <clears throat> assuming one individual, the DNA profile from item 128S1 is at least 100 billion times more likely to occur if it originated from the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush than if it originated from an unknown individual. And everyone else is eliminated. And if we can bring up State Police Exhibit 317. <coughs> No, oh, okay, I apologize. Submission, or State Police Exhibit 317 was identified as two swabs from Area B from the Chevy Suburban and subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission number 129. Um, same results? Yes. State Police Exhibit 318 which was identified as two swabs from Area C of the Chevy Suburban and designated as submission 130. Same results? Yes. State Police Exhibit 99 is identified as two swabs taken of the top half of the steering, steering wheel and subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services as submission number 12. And for your benefit, Ms. Maydell, this is in reports 1 and 9. What were the results? The results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 12S1 being a mixture of two contributors. Assuming two contributors, the DNA profile from item 12S1 is at least 100 billion times more likely to occur if it originated from the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush and one unknown individual than if it originated from two unknown individuals. <coughs> Assuming two contributors, Given the low likelihood ratios calculated, the results are inconclusive to whether Fotis Dulos could be a contributor to the DNA profile from item 12S1. Michelle Traconis is eliminated as a contributor to the DNA profile, profile from item 12S1. And directing your attention now to DNA Supplemental Report number nine, 
It's my understanding that with the exception of Theodore, the Dubos children, Lauren Almeida, and Pavel Guimi were eliminated. That is correct. The low likelihood ratio is calculated. The results are inconclusive whether Theodore Dulos could be a contributor to the profile of 12S1. State Police Exhibit 100. <coughs> could I just have a moment, Council? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I apologize. That's fine. State Police Exhibit 100, which was identified as two swabs taken from the bottom half of the steering wheel and subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services as submission number 13. And this is in DNA Reports 1 and 9, Ms. Maydell. The results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 13S1 being a mixture of two contributors. Assuming two contributors, the DNA profile from item 13S1 is at least 100 billion times more likely to occur if it originated from the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush and one unknown individual than if it originated from two unknown individuals. Fotis Dulos and Michelle Traconis are eliminated as a contributor to the DNA profile from item 13S1. And DNA supplemental report number nine. My understanding is that the Dulos children and Pavel Glimmy were eliminated and the results were inconclusive as to Lauren Almeida. Is that correct? That is correct. State Police Exhibit 101, which was identified as two swabs taken from the gear shift and subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services as submission number 14. And this is found in reports one and nine, Ms. Maydell. The results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 14S1 originating from a single female individual. Assuming one individual, the DNA profile from item 14S1 is at least 780,000 more times likely to occur if it originated from the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush than if it originated from an unknown individual. Fotis Dulos and Michelle Traconis are eliminated as a source of the DNA profile from 14S1. And in DNA Supplemental Report number 9, you concluded that all the Dulos children, Lauren Almeida and Pavel Gulimi, were eliminated. Is that correct? That is correct. We can call up State Police Exhibit 108. This was identified as two swabs of a blood-like smudge KM positive taken from the exterior side of the right front door and subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 126. And Ms. Maydell, for your benefit, this can be found in DNA's reports 7 and 10. Could you just indicate what the results were? Can you repeat the number again, 126? Six. Six. <clears throat> the results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 126, B S1, being a mixture of two contributors. Assuming two contributors, the DNA profile from item 126 S1 is at least 11 million times more likely to occur if it originated from the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush and one unknown individual than if it originated from two unknown individuals. Fotis Dulos and Michelle Traconis are eliminated as contributors to the DNA profile from number 126S1. And um, in DNA supplemental report number 10, I believe you concluded that given the low likelihood ratios, the results were inconclusive as to the Dulos children. However, Lauren Almeida and Pavel Buemi were eliminated. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. State Police Exhibit number 113, this was identified as two swabs of a latent smudge from the exterior side of the tailgate and subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission number 16. 
And this is in reports one and nine for your benefit, Ms. Modell. The results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 16S1, originating from a single female individual. Assuming one individual, given the low likelihood ratios calculated, the results are inconclusive as to whether the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush could be the source of the DNA profile from item 16S1. Fotis Dulos and Michelle Draconis are eliminated as the source of the profile from item 16S1. And in DNA supplemental report number nine, you concluded that all the Dulos children, Lauren Almeida and Pavel Gulimi were eliminated. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Uh, State Police Exhibit number 119. This was identified as two swabs taken from the garage door opener on the driver's side visor and subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission number 69. And it's found in reports three and nine, Ms. Maydell. The results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 69S1 being a mixture of three contributors with at least one of them being male. Assuming three contributors, the DNA profile from item 69S1 is at least 100 billion times more likely to occur if it originated from the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush and two unknown individuals than if it originated from three unknown individuals. The results do not support the hypothesis that Fotis Dulos is a contributor to this profile. Assuming three contributors, Fotis Dulos is eliminated as a contributor to the DNA profile from item 69S1. And the results also do not support the hypothesis that Michelle Draconis is a contributor to this profile. Assuming three contributors, Michelle Draconis is eliminated as a contributor to the DNA profile from 69S1. And in DNA supplemental report number nine, you concluded that um, Lauren Almeida, Pavel Guimi were eliminated. You also concluded that all of the children, with the exception of Constantine Dulos, was eliminated. And with respect to Constantine Dulos, you concluded that assuming three contributors, it was 210,000 times more likely to occur if Constantine Dulos was a contributor with two unknowns as opposed to three unknowns. Is that correct? Christiane Dulos. Christiane Dulos, excuse yes. me. Yes. Constantine's eliminated. Christiane is the 210,000 more times likely. If we can pull up states 121. This is identified as two swabs of a blood-like stain KM positive taken from the cargo area floor and subsequently designated as submission number 17. And this is in reports one and nine for your benefit, Ms. Maydell. What were the results of this? <clears throat> the results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 17S1 being a mixture of two contributors. Assuming two contributors, the DNA profile from item 17S1 is at least 31,000 times more likely to occur if it originated from the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush and one unknown, and one unknown individual than if it originated from two unknown individuals. Fotis Dulos and Michelle, Michelle Traconis are eliminated as a contributor to the DNA profile from 17S1. Senator McGinnis, we are going to take our lunch and recess at this time. Judge, I'm sorry, may I just finish up with uh, this one exhibit? Just one more question. Well, remember, we are only going to be here an hour at 2 o'clock. So you may finish. Thank you. And just um, 
continuing on to supplemental report number nine. What was your conclusion? Assuming two contributors, given the low <laughs> likelihood ratios calculated, the results are inconclusive as to whether Petros Dulos, Constantine Dulos, Christiane Dulos, C. Noel Dulos, or Theodore Dulos could be a contributor to the DNA profile from 17S1. And Lauren Almeida and Pablo Gumini are eliminated as contributors to 17S1. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will attempt to address the frigid conditions in your deliberation room. And we'll resume at 2 o'clock. We will only have an hour this afternoon before we adjourn. So please do not discuss the case and have a good lunch.
You can bring the jury in, please. Council stipulate, please. Yes, Judge. Yes. Well, the first question is, is anything any better? Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Maydell. Good afternoon. Um, the next several results that I'm going to be discussing with you are found in DNA Supplemental Report 11. And... Um, Just going to read from the stipulation here, State's Exhibit Number 28. State Police Exhibit 370 identified as four swabs from an unstained area of the steering wheel and subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 134. Ms. Maydell, what were the results of that submission? The results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 134S1 being a mixture of three contributors with at least one of them being male. Assuming three contributors, the DNA profile from item 134S1 is at least 100 billion times more likely to occur if it originated from the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush and two unknown individuals than if it originated from three unknown individuals. The results do not support the hypothesis that Fotis Dulos, Petros Dulos, Constantine Dulos, Christian Dulos, C. Noel Dulos, and Theodore Dulos are contributors to this profile. Assuming three contributors, Fotis Dulos, Petros Dulos, Constantine Dulos, Christian Dulos, C. Noel Dulos, and Theodore Dulos are eliminated as contributors to the DNA profile from 134S1. Assuming three contributors, Given the low likelihood ratios calculated, the results are inconclusive as to whether Michelle Traconis or Lauren Almeida could be contributors to the DNA profile from item 134S1. Paolo Gumini is eliminated as a contributor to the DNA profile from item 134S1. State Police Exhibit 371, which is identified as four swabs from the area with blood light staining on the steering wheel, Subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 135. What were the results of that analysis? The results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 135S1 being a mixture of two contributors. The results do not support the hypothesis that the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush, Michelle Traconis, or Lauren Almeida are contributors to this profile. Assuming two contributors, the sources of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush, Michelle Traconis and Lauren Almeida are eliminated as contributors to the DNA profile from item 135S1. Fotis Dulos, Petros Dulos, Constantine Dulos, Christine Dulos, C. Noel Newt Dulos, Theodore Dulos, and Pavel Gumeni are eliminated as contributors to the DNA profile from item 135S1. State Police Exhibit 372, which was identified as four swabs from the interior side of the left front door, was submitted to the Division of Scientific Services as submission 136. And just with respect to these results, um, the results were consistent with a single individual, but every um, known profile along with the profile obtained from the toothbrush were eliminated. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. State Police Exhibit 373, which was identified as two swabs from the left front seat adjustment controls, was subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 137. <coughs> Can you please indicate to the jury what the results were there? The results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 137S1 being a mixture of two contributors. 
assuming two contributors, the DNA profile from item 137S1 is at least 1.3 billion times more likely to occur if it originated from the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush and one unknown individual than if it originated from two unknown individuals. Assuming two contributors, given the low likelihood ratios calculated, the results are inconclusive whether Petros Dulos, Constantine Dulos, Christian Dulos, C. Noel Dulos, or Theodore Dulos could be contributors to the DNA profile from 137S1. Fotis Dulos, Michelle Traconis, Lauren Almeida, and Pavel Gumini are eliminated as contributors to the DNA profile from item 137S1. State Police Exhibit 374, which was identified as two swabs from their rear view mirror, was subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 138. What were the results of that submission? The results are consistent with the DNA profile from item 138S1 originating from a single individual. Assuming one individual, given the low likelihood ratios calculated, the results are inconclusive as to whether the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush. The results are inconclusive as to whether the source of the DNA profile from the swabbing of the electric toothbrush could be the source of the DNA profile from item 138S1. And everyone else was eliminated, is that correct? Yes. And State Police Exhibit 375, which was identified as two swabs from the cargo area, rear seat controls, and subsequently submitted to the Division of Scientific Services and designated as submission 139. No profile was obtained, is that correct? That is correct. Now, I wanted to talk to you about um, circumstances that can influence the presence or lack thereof of DNA. Um, could clothing or gloves or other um, objects in between a person and a surface impact the amount of DNA that is ultimately left on the surface? Uh, if you, you're talking about from your hands? So for example, if somebody's wearing gloves, could that impact whether or not they leave DNA on a particular surface? If they're touching something with gloves, correct. The, the gloves will interfere with leaving the touch cells from your hands. And in terms of um, whether or not, let's just say hypothetically blood or a blood-like substance is left on an object and that item is subsequently swiped with either a cloth or a paper towel, could that also influence the amount of DNA that's left behind? Yes. How so? Well, if you use uh, something to wipe up something and then throw it away, you're cleaning up some of that liquid or whatever it is, blood. Um, so then you're losing some of that DNA that was there and just leaving behind remnants of it. And does DNA um, degrade under certain conditions as well? It does. What does it mean when DNA degrades? <clears throat> the DNA is breaking up and you're getting less of it. So if it's uh, under the influence of the ultraviolet light, bleach, um, moisture, heat, all different um, factors can degrade DNA over time. If I could just have a moment, Your Honor. I have nothing additional, Judge. Thank you. Cross-examination. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Ms. Mabel. Good afternoon. So I'm looking at your... Um, resume, which has been put into evidence, you have a degree in biology, right? Yes. So I'm going to ask you some questions about, for those of us who didn't major in biology, okay? So when we're talking about DNA, we're talking about um, something that is transmitted. Everybody has DNA, correct? We all, every, every living thing has DNA, correct? Yes. Whether it's a plant, a bug, an animal, or a human, right? Yes. At least with it, when it comes to human beings, there are uh, two sets of DNA that we inherit from our parents, correct? Correct. Half from your mom and half from your dad. So if we, so 
we go back to basic biology, you have a mom and you have a dad, they have a child, and they inherit the DNA half from the father and half from the mother, right? Correct. And uh, unless there's artificial insemination, you need two separate parents for that process to take place, right? Correct. And that within the DNA, there's something called alleles, correct? Those are, yes, the specific types of the DNA profile. And they're, you know, for those of us who remember this from, uh, from maybe high school biology, the DNA is kind of a double helix. It's sort of a twisty thing. That's what it's, how it's described. I think that's, if you use an electron microscope, that's how it'll appear, right? It's like a twisted ladder or spiral staircase, yes. And within that twisted ladder or spiral staircase, there are the alleles repeat at certain intervals, correct? Correct. And in any event, you're going to uh, inherit half of your alleles from the male side, the dad, and half the alleles from the mom side, right? Correct. So one of the ways that these, um, these uh, ancestry <laughs> organizations work is they can trace your ancestry based on a, maybe a cheek swab or something, looking at other people in the database to see whether you're related to somebody else, right? Correct, yes. Because there'll be a lot of similarities between you and your parents and your children, right? There could be, yes. And in any event, um, if there are twins, whether they're identical or they're um, um, fraternal twins, they're at least close in, there'll be a lot of similar DNA, right? There could be. So when you're um, running this program, the STR mix program, right? This is a proprietary program, right? We do not know the source code. We know how it works, but we do not know the source code. Right. In other words, it's a private company that has patented this calculation simulation, right? It's a private company, yes. So you're programming in information, right? I put in the DNA profile. And other information, too, right? Yes, I tell it how many number of contributors I believe it is. Right, and, and I want to ask you about that. You put in a number of contributors that you believe or assume are in a mixture of DNA, right? Based on my knowledge, training, experience looking at profiles, yes, I give my best estimate of how many contributors I believe that DNA profile is from the data. And, of course, that makes it more difficult when there's multiple contributors, right? Sometimes it can, yes. And in addition to that, if you have a very tiny sample that's only a partial DNA, it's even more complicated, isn't it? It can be, yes. And some of the things when you talked about it, uh, you, you said that it was inconclusive. Part of the reason was the sample wasn't even big enough to get enough alleles and repetition within a uh, sample. Isn't that true? Well, I'd have to know exactly what sample we're talking about. But... Well, I'm using just in general. We went through a lot. Some of them, it was inconclusive because it was too small a sample for you to be able to derive a profile from it, right? I think, yeah, I, I call those insufficient, I believe, when it's too small of an amount to make a comparison. Okay, well, you're using the word insufficient, whether it's little or insufficient, it's just not enough sample for you to develop a profile of a person, right? You're talking about two different conclusions, yes. All right, well, yeah. fine, all right. Now, when it comes to what the lab does, you're not actually comparing the whole DNA to another person, are you? I don't understand your question. You're only choosing alleles from certain pinpointed locations along the double helix, right? Well, 99% of everybody's DNA is the same, and we focus on this 1% that is var most variable between individuals. And we use a kit that has a certain amount of sites that we do test. Yeah, so it's not every single site, but it's a representation of some of the right. alleles and, that vary. And currently, the system you use has, I believe, what, 21? Autosomals for statistics, a global filer. Yes. Right, also global filer. Global you global. take 21 points along the DNA strand to make a comparison, right? 21 autosomal sites, yeah, locus. No, it's not a genome of that person or anybody, right? It's not their whole genome, no. Okay. And just for clarification, how many loci are there on, in a human DNA? 
Oh, I don't know the answer to that. Is it in the hundreds? Well, the question really is, uh, what is the range or an estimate generally to overrule? Give us an estimate. Uh, I honestly really don't know if it's hundreds or thousands. What, what was that number? I honestly don't know if it's hundreds or thousands for how many loci. It, it may be hundreds of thousands, right? It, it could be. I honestly really do not know. But we're only focusing on either 21 or maybe 23 locations along the strand, right? Very discriminating locations, yes. And when you're looking at alleles, right, you're not just looking at what the specific allele is called, because they'll have numbers and letters, right? Numbers. But how often it repeats along a DNA strand, right? Right, that number is how many times it's repeated. And that's how you determine whether it's unique to a particular person or you can compare it to another person, right? That's how I just determine the DNA profile is by the number of repeats at each testing site. And some of the alleles occur in a large percentage of the, of the, the I'm using the word loci because uh, loci basically means places, right, or pinpoints, right? Those are the different sites that we're testing, yes. Right. But I'm using the word loci so that the jury understands that that word is a Latin term for location, basically. Mm -hmm. It's another way of saying that, right? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes, sorry. Okay. So <clears throat> certain of the loci, for example, are only found in male DNA, right? Yes, there are sites that we test that are only found on the Y chromosome. And are there some that are only found in the X chromosome? That would be mitochondrial DNA. Okay. And you, according to your uh, resume, had some experience in doing mitochondrial, mitochondrial DNA uh, testing, right? I do, yes. But we're not talking about that here, are we? No. Some of the DNA repeats, the, there's, they're, given gen, they're given actual numbers, either whole numbers or decibel partial numbers, right? Correct. And that's how you determine how often it's going to repeat on the DNA, correct? In that specific location, that's how many times that length variation repeats, yes. And if you look at one of your reports, there's a chart that's contained in many of them, right? Correct. We used to produce an allele table with everybody's types on it. And if it shows the numbers, those are the, any numbers you put on there showing uh, how often something repeats in your sample, right? At that specific site, yes. And you're also looking at an unknown sample, the one that came in on a swab or on a, uh, a piece of material or whatever else that you are taking to determine whether or not that DNA shows similar repetitions as one of the people you're testing against, right? I am comparing the DNA types from a known profile to the DNA types of an evidentiary profile, yes. And when you, you use the word um, during your, your direct examination a lot, assuming X or Y or assuming this or that, did you, you made certain assumptions as to many of these uh, samples before you then compared it to something else, right? Correct. I determine the number of contributors in the evidentiary profiles before I compare them. But you also, for some of them, assumed, let's say, that the uh, persons whose, person whose DNA was on the toothbrush, right, was one of the contributors to the sample, right? In certain non-probative um, pieces of evidence, yes, we do do that. Well, you, you're using words like non-probative. You made the determination to use that regardless of whether you think it's probative or not, right? No, we only can use and uh, we only can condition a known profile on an item if it's a non-probative comparison. Typically, uh, a victim that you would expect reason scientific expectation that the profile should be there. So, like if I my car gets stolen and it's recovered and uh, they swab the steering wheel, you would expect my DNA profile to be on the steering wheel with anybody else who may have drove it. So we would condition my DNA profile if it was truly there. If I looked at the results and saw my types there, 
I would condition my known in order to get the second contributor um, better explained. So you're assuming, by what I assume by that answer, you were assuming that you, your DNA would be on your, on your steering wheel. If saying. looking at the data, it was there, yes. But it has looking at the data, I have to see my types there. I wouldn't just say I'm there. I would look at the data and see that my types are there. But if you assumed that the contributor was someone else, whether it was a close family relative or not, it would change the uh, likelihood ratios, wouldn't it? Well, we would have to have a scientific That's a yes expectation. Or no, wouldn't it? Well, to indicate to an expert what the expert's answer is when an expert is qualified by education, knowledge, training, experience, and skill is inappropriate. Secondly, the witness took an oath to tell the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth to tell the witness what the answer should be is inappropriate you can move no, you can move it to have it stricken as non-responsive but this court does not permit counsel to tell a witness what their testimony should be yes your honor let me so you rephrase. can ask the question again Right. But let me rephrase the question. <clears throat> Regardless of whether I use the example of your steering wheel or not use any example whatsoever, the assumptions that you made about a contributor would, if you changed that assumption to a different known contributor, it would alter the likelihood ratio that would be come out of the STR mix computer program, correct? Again, it's hard to answer as a yes or a no. So it wouldn't change it? It would come out the same? No, it could, but it all depends on the data and if that person is scientifically expected to, you know, be on that profile and their profile is there. But once you run the program and you come up with a deconvolution report, on using STR mix, mm -hmm. when you then test it against someone else, you don't go back and pretend you don't know who the source is. You start with what you've already, we'll call it deconvoluted, right? You have one original deconvolution, yes. Right. So when you add someone, you're starting with the likelihood ratios that the computer has spit out for you previously, right? You don't get the likelihood ratios until you make a comparison to an individual. But you don't do a full deconvolution analysis again over the same sample if you're running it against other people. Is that a fair statement? I'm sorry, can you say it again? Yeah. If you decide to check a sample, an unknown, against other people, you start with the report that was already developed from the STR mix computer printout previously, correct? Correct, yes. Okay. Let me just ask you some questions about some of the other things that came up on direct examination. A lot of the descriptions, both in the, uh, in the stipulation that we've entered into, the lawyers have entered into, and in your report, make reference to descriptions such as swabs from a blood-like stain, luminal plus whatever, KM plus, these are things that you mentioned. Those were how it came to you in, with a title on it, right? Yes, that was how the submitting agency named that piece of evidence. So you didn't label that this had a, uh, was a blood-like stain, did you? I did not, no. The police was called it that, right? Yeah, whoever the submitting agency was, yes. Same thing with if they said Castle Meyer KM plus, that's just the police writing that down on the sample that they put on the bag that they then submit to the lab, right? Correct, yes. Same thing with if they use luminol, that is just something they wrote on the bag, right? I'm just going to object, Your Honor, at this point. Right. Can we have a brief 
sidebar concluding this week? Well, <clears throat> first, the nature of the questions are simply as the court understands them. <clears throat> this witness did not write the descriptions on the bags. And this witness has stated she did not write the descriptions on the bags. So the court does not really see, unless there's a relevance objection, the necessity for a sidebar. Well, I, I, I may have you heard, Your Honor. Yes. I, I'm objecting because I think it mischaracterizes what happened. I think the question sort of assumes that the police are just writing these things as though no test was done. And I, and I don't think that that's what the evidence is. Well, that's a, essentially, is the, in the court's view, an extraction from the question. The questions appear to be very simple. There was information on the bag when you first saw them. That's how the court hears the question. So what is flowing from that, uh, the court cannot contemplate, other than the fact that there was information on the bag and she did not write it. Overruled. Am I correct? It was just something that was written on the description that you then note. You didn't change the description that the police put on it, correct? No, we used what the police describe it as, so it continues through. Right. You just give it your own letters and numbers to distinguish what you do from the exhibit and description that the police put on there, right? Yes, we have unique item numbers for our um, pieces of evidence under our case number. Right. And, and I just want to be clear, um, you <coughs> indicated that you're familiar with um, a little bit with Castlemeyer KM. Is that right? I am, yes. But you're not a biologist, right? Um, I'm a forensic scientist who I've had training on KM. I have a proficiency test twice a year in order to perform KM, so I can perform KM testing. And, and, and I've been just, trained. That, I didn't want to interrupt. Did you finish your answer? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And KM... Cannot is not used. It's a, one of these presumptive tests, right? It's a we call it a screening test. A screening test. It does not mean that a substance is blood, does it? No, it, it just is testing to see if there could be the presence of blood. There could be, but you're familiar with the fact that many other things test positive if you use a KM on it, right? Yes, other things can make a positive result. And and we're not just talking about animal blood, are we? No, there's other plants and uh, horseradish. There's a couple things that will make um, the test turn positive. But we're trained to swab things that are reddish brown um, in color and not just any swab. But you made no determination as to whether or not any of these items yourself, you didn't determine whether they contain blood or not, did you? Um, I do believe that there are some items in here that we did do KM testing on at the lab. That, that would have been Christine Roy, but... I have some of those results in my lab, in my well, reports. No, I, I'm saying you personally did not. No, me personally, no. All these evidence items went to um, forensic biology first, and they did all the testing. And, and you know that you would not rely on a KM test to make a determination as to whether something actually was blood or not, would you? No, KM testing cannot tell you that it's 100% blood. Well, it can't even tell you if it's 99% blood, can it? No. Potatoes are one of those things that test positive, right? I, like, I don't know definitely that. I know horseradish and some, we were trained to, to know that horseradish and some plant peroxidases do, but I mean. And rust can too, right? Rust is kind of um, tricky. Sometimes that, so when you do KM testing, you add that first colorless liquid and rust makes it change pink then versus you're not supposed to change pink until after you add the second solution. So rust is kind of like a false positive. In any way, rust, from your own personal knowledge, is kind of a reddish-brown color, too, isn't it? It is, yes. And you wouldn't say that um, it's scientifically reliable. That is, uh, any reagent uh, presumptive test is not reliable for finding blood, is it? Uh, I, I would say the screening test is reliable for saying that it's KM positive and there's a chance that blood would be there, but we can't say that. It was blood, no. You're saying there's a chance that there is. My question is you wouldn't testify that as a result of a KM test that that something was, in fact, human blood, would you? I would not, no. Do 
you're also aware that most of the items that you went through that you tested for were not even screened for whether there was actually blood or not through the biology portion of your lab. Isn't that correct? Yeah, the ones that come in that are already labeled KM positive, or luminal positive, or even negative, uh, we don't repeat that test because we do the same tests and we trust that the PD did their correct testing and we wouldn't waste samples from the swabs to do that test again and um, take some of that sample that would then maybe not lead to a full DNA profile. Ms. Mano, you're, you're not in the biology department that does the uh, testing for blood, are you? I do know the protocols, though. All right, but you're not in that department, right? Um, forensic biology and DNA kind of are intertwined, and I'm trained on some evidence exam, and I'm competent on KM, so you know, I'm not, but I'm majorly a part of the DNA unit. And I, I just want to be clear. You would not testify under oath that something was, in fact, blood based solely on the fact it was a positive KM test, would you? No, I would not. And I, when I asked you, most of the samples that we went through earlier with through the state, you went through a hundred maybe samples. I asked you whether or not most of them were not tested at the lab, and I don't think you answered that question. Am I correct that most of them were not tested with a confirmatory test for what it was, correct? None of them were tested in these samples as confirmatory. Earlier, when you were asked where, what are the sources of DNA, you made reference to um, blood. Let me just look at my notes here. You said blood, semen, I think you said hair, and you said bones, right? Didn't you leave out like the major source of DNA in that answer? What did I, blood, semen, saliva? Bones, teeth, hair. How about skin? Cells, skin cells. Skin cells, okay. Let's talk about skin cells. All of us have skin cells, right? Yes. And all of us have the same DNA in our skin cells that we do in our hair, in our blood, in our, um, shall we just say, our fl bodily fluids, right? Correct, yes. So you could take a cheek sample swab, right? And you would run a DNA profile on that cheek swab. You follow me so far, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And it would be the same result for the DNA profile as if I took a sample of blood, right? From the same person, yes. Well, that's what I meant, yeah. from the mm -hmm. same person. Okay. And when it comes to skin cells, for most people, they're shedding skin cells all the time, aren't they? Yes. And in fact, if you cough or sneeze, you're also through um, what they call aerosolation, right? You're ex expelling DNA that way too, aren't you? Yes, that's possible, yes. When it comes to DNA, there's also something called primary transfer and secondary transfer. Is that correct? Yes. And I'm not sure you explained the distinction between those, but if we're talking about touch DNA, right, when you get a sample, does the biology forensic portion of your lab note on the file jacket whether something is touch DNA or some kind of fluid uh, DNA? They do. And um, when you gave your testimony today, you did not distinguish between whether any of the samples that you tested and re-identified with the letters and numbers that we went through, whether they were touch DNA or something else, right? Correct, I do not. I just test the evidence that they submit forward to me. However it comes to you, you do a DNA profile, and then you run the test on that regardless of what the source is, right? Yes. And when there's a mixture, as you pointed out, of more than one source in a DNA, one might be from a liquid source, and one might be touch DNA at the same time, right? That's 
That is possible, yes. We can't distinguish where the DNA came from. And, and if, for example, if I were to sneeze into my hand, as some people hopefully don't do, and then touch a doorknob, chances are that I'm going to, there, there might be a mixture of just me of both the skin DNA and maybe a liquid DNA on that doorknob, right? That's possible, yes. And then if someone else goes and touches that doorknob, they're not only going to maybe have a disgusting mess on their hand, maybe get some cold germs, but they're going to maybe get some of that transfer of the other person's DNA onto them. Is that right? That's possible, yes. All right. And then if I were to come over, or I don't know, use me, if that person was then to go over and shake someone else's hand, that's what secondary transfer is. If now my DNA or the, the first person's DNA is now on that hand of that second person, right? That's possible, yes. And, and that's regardless of whether someone's wearing gloves or not, right? No, I can pick, pick if they touch a doorknob with gloves on and then touch something else with the gloves on, the DNA would be on the gloves. It would, the DNA could then transfer to that other person as Correct. well. Correct, yes. And to other surfaces that they then touch, right? That is possible, yes. And when you talk about, there were a couple of examples you gave, but there are maybe four or even five contributors to a sample, right? Sometimes we have four or five, yes. And it gets more complicated, more convoluted, if you will, to try and uh, separate it out the more contributors you have, right? And that's why we use StarMix, yes. Exactly, mm -hmm. right? And then you're relying on StarMix because it's just running this program to give you likelihoods of uh, hypothesis A versus hypothesis B, right? No, it's actually, StarMix is giving us weights to best explain the different components that actually make up that mixture profile. That's what Star Mix is. But what I'm trying to understand is it's not making a match to anybody, is it? No, it's deconvoluting that mixture of four people to try and determine the best explanation of the four different people that are contributing to that four person. But in any event, the word is the likelihood, not an actual. It's not identifying anyone, is it? No, it doesn't identify anybody. And when a report is inconclusive, I think you indicated, and you, you said it a few times, one of the ways that it's inconclusive is the sample is either too small for there to be enough allele locations to be able to be clear on who that person, who it might be connected with, correct? I believe that's my insufficient conclusion, insufficient for comparison. And inconclusive means either there's too many people that maybe have similar DNA, or it's just not enough points of reference to make a determination, right? The inconclusive is when we do that likelihood ratio, the, and the likelihood ratio comes out to be in this range that is below a positive association, but above being eliminated. So right. that's why we can't make a conclusion. Right, and the danger, of course, with inconclusive is there can be false positives, and you could make mistakes if you try to subscribe an uh, inconclusive result to anyone in particular, right? Well, we just have that range that we say is inconclusive because it's not above our what we deem positive. Well, when you say we, it's a scientific level that's been established by the lab, right? That it's not a positive association, correct. And when you say someone is excluded, it's because there is a, an allele present that you know from the profile of the actual person is missing or is missing completely, right? Well, it's not just one allele, it's the profile overall. Oh, I meant to say it, that if you count all of the alleles that you produce, even if it's more than one person, that the individual you're comparing it against is actually, does not have that allele at all, right? That's how you eliminate somebody. Not just from one allele. You have to look at the profile overall, the data, the number of contributors, the peak height. So it's a little bit more complicated than just not having one allele. So other than in a couple of situations where there was uh, inconclusive information, and I think you mentioned that every one of the people you mentioned had at least one inconclusive, right? Whether they were a contributor or not, right? All the children were at least inconclusive once overall. I'm trying to be, make a broad question. You went okay. through 100. I could pull out the individual ones, but okay. I'm just trying to. Yes, there the were some where all the children were at least, on one occasion, inconclusive, right? Yes. 
And in others, they were actually contributors. Yes. And then there's others where they were eliminated. Yes. And then there was a fourth category you said, where I think you said it cannot be eliminated, right? Yes. That was because it was a higher threshold than inconclusive, but less than identified as a contributor, right? So the cannot be eliminated is a positive association that it was just a, a terminology that we used to use, um, and we've currently changed the way we report that as consistent with the contributor, which I defined also, because it was confusing to people for us to say cannot be eliminated because we were saying eliminated, but it was actually the opposite. You cannot be eliminated. So it's a still a positive association. It's just the wording was a little different. Yeah, but I want to be clear. When you say a positive association, it's below a threshold where you could testify that that person's DNA was actually present, correct? No, it was a positive association. They were uh, they were our match. They were a partial match, but they were our match and had a positive association. When you say partial, you're again talking about that you could not testify that it was a match because it was only a partial identification or partial connection, right? It was a partial match, but it had a positive likelihood ratio. Again, that's the computer saying it's a likelihood ratio, right? A positive likelihood. Well, we used StarMix to calculate that because it would take us too long to do all those hand calculations. And I take it you've never tried to mimic a SDR mix report by hand calculating out the odds, have you? In my training, I only had to do it once. Right. Correct. I have not done a million times, no. A million times. Uh, <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the machine does it runs uh, odds a million times, doesn't it? It has many iterations to try and describe the components of the profile, and then, then it calculates the likelihood ratio. All right. Let me, let me ask you a different question. Let me put it to a different way. The program runs what's known as an algorithm, right? Correct. That's, that's the proprietary source code for STR mix, right? Within the mathematical process, yes. And you don't know, you could not describe how that process actually, you don't know the code is what I'm trying to get at. I do not know the code of the algorithm. No, I do not. But these kind of programs that run these kind of likelihood of an, a certain result are similar to what's used by the lottery for calculating the odds of winning the Powerball, right? I'm not, I honestly do not know what kind of calculation they use right. for that. Well, are you familiar with the term the Markov chain Monte Carlo? Yes, that's the mathematical process used in... Star mix, yes. Okay. Do you know why the word Monte Carlo is part of the name? Right, because it was originally originating from a gambling. Yes, but I didn't know that that was used for the lottery. All right. But, all right, so the gambling, though, right? Yep. You're, you're talking about Monte Carlo as the capital in Monaco in Europe, which is a big gambling mecca, right? Yes. And what they're doing is they're calc that kind of program calculates the odds of winning the jackpot on whatever machine, gambling machine, is being run with a giant jackpot, right? You don't know? I guess, I, yeah, I don't know that. All right, but if using that as an example though, if two people, if, if the odds of winning the billion dollar Powerball according to a, a program, an algorithm such as this, were one in a hundred billion, right? Just assume for my, my hypothetical here, does that mean if two people were to win it that they were cheating? That's different odds. You're saying one in a hundred billion where we're having the likelihood ratio with two competing hypotheses. So given my likelihood ratio is different than right. that. And again, we're talking about hypotheses. Again, you're basing the hypothesis based on a prosecution's theory of a case, right? No, we base it on the background information of a case and the actual profile itself. Well, who decides on the on the hypothesis? You or I someone do. else? Yes. You make the determination. The DNA analyst. Hypothesis. Yes. And you have to read something about a case just to make that hypothesis, right? You need background information on how, what the kind of case is. Yes, and the pieces of evidence. Yes. Because otherwise, it's not like you're blindly taking a piece of evidence, putting it into a machine, and then coming up with a result without you having subjective input, right? Correct. Okay.
And just so that I'm clear, I'm going to go back to the issue of you already testified that what the SGR mix is doing is not matching a sample to a particular person or two people or three. It's giving a likelihood of a ratio based on two hypotheses, right? And how likely that evidence is to occur given hypothesis one compared to hypothesis two. And when you say likelihood, we're talking about odds, aren't we? Yes. Mathematical odds, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. And um, So these odds are not based on population numbers either, are they? No, it's not a frequency estimate, no. So when we hear large numbers like 10 billion or 4 billion or 150 or 250,000 and or 100 billion, we're not talking about other people on Earth, are we? No, we're not. Those numbers have nothing to do with populations, correct? Correct. And when we talk about um, skin cell DNA, you refer, you refer to that as touch DNA, right? So the forensic community is trying not to um, refer to some low-level DNA that might be collected from a surface as touch anymore because we don't want to imply that someone actually did touch this counter and left their DNA. So we're calling it more trace DNA when it's small amounts recovered from an object or surface. You are aware, though, that even at least at the time of 2019, the, science, the, the folder, some of the forensic folders from your lab still are using terms like touch in relation to this very case, right? Well, yes. I mean, that's kind of also just for them to distinguish between when they have a, a piece of clothing that has bloody areas and then has non-bloody areas. They're just making that notation to say, like, I'm trying to avoid swabbing where the blood is, so this is an area that didn't appear to have a reddish-brown stain, so I swabbed it, the, the touch area, where something might have been touched versus having a body fluid on it. And if somebody, for example, is, if I stay away from the word touch and instead use the term um, skin cells, that would be a better way to describe it, right? Describe? The word touch DNA. Yes, I mean, touch DNA, yes. If you're saying someone touched something, you would get skin cells there, yes. But if, let's say, I don't know, a police officer is walking through uh, a house touching things, chances are that person's DNA might be found on those areas that were touched, right? It could be, yes. And if you have uh, a result where you have unknown contributors to the DNA, it could be anybody who walked through that door who isn't separately tested to see if it belongs to them, right? That's possible, yes. <clears throat> who told you to limit your DNA um, comparison to the children, to Lauren Almeida, to Fotis Dulos and Michelle Traconis, and Pavel Gumieni? I only can make comparisons to the knowns that are submitted from the agencies, so that's what I do. When I get a known that's submitted by an agency, it gets processed, and that's who I make the comparisons to. I don't ask for additional knowns unless it's for an elimination known, like the situation for a stolen car. We get a swab of a steering wheel. It's a two-person mixture. I don't know if that person who owns the car is on there, too, so I would ask for their known. But otherwise, I wouldn't ask for particular knowns unless there was a... And I don't think you were asked this by uh, the state, so I just want to uh, ask you this. When, you're, when a swab is submitted to you, it's from some surface has been wiped. Let's, let's set aside for a moment if an actual object or cloth, as you said, clo item of clothing or something is submitted. We're just talking about a swab. Okay. You have not observed how well or how poorly that swab has been uh, administered, correct? Yeah, if I did not make the cutting of the swab, I did not see it. Therefore, I don't know. Yeah, what the swab looked like. You get? Do you do you get the the uh, actual cutting, or do you get the the chemical or liquid that that cutting of the swab was put into? No, I get the actual swab in a tube. But you get a cotton. snip off of. It's like a giant cotton tip applicator, right? So those of us who have had. COVID testing, no, it's like these long sticks with a cotton tip at the end, right? Correct, yes. Bigger so, than a Q-tip that you might 
find in a in a in the in a hotel bathroom here, right? So yeah, the forensic biologist would cut that swab, that cotton part off, and put it into a tube. Put in a tube, then it's given to you. Correct. And then you do something uh, where you uh, you copy that sample. Is that right? Well, first of all, we extract it first, get the extract, then we see how much DNA we have, and then we make all those many copies so we can hopefully generate a DNA profile. And at least as of 2019, when most of this, 2019 and 2020, when most of these comparisons were done, you were able to extract um, some DNA from as little as three cells, right? Um, I'd have to go back and look at my quant values for all this thing to testify that I did have something that, that was that was that small amount. Is that in are any of the reports up there for you to do that? No. Well, well you used at the time, is it Fusion 6C? Fusion 6C was the STR kit for 19, 2019 and 20, yes. And you were you would take a sample. These are tiny, tiny amounts, right? There could be tiny, tiny amounts of DNA, yes. And, and so the jury has some kind of semblance of, of size. One cell, as I understand it, is 6.6 .6 picograms in, is that weight or, or size? Weight, weight, yes. And so that we're clear, you know, you've got grams, you have milligrams, you have nanograms, and you go down to picograms. Right? Correct. And a pico, one picogram is a trillionth of a gram, right? One picogram. Yes. You should I note believe, this I is math, so. right? Yes. Yep. Am I right? Yes. Okay. So if you have one cell is 6.6 .6 .6 picograms, we're talking about 6.6 .6 trillionths of a gram, right? And if I'm, you're not disagreeing that it's, you can, you can get a sample out of it, a three, as little as three cells. So three cells would be 18 picograms, approximately. Well, 6.6 6 6 times so three, yes. More like 20. So 20 right? picograms. Okay. Um, you might get a few peaks. We target, we target for fusion, we were targeting 500 picograms. To That's get a, your goal. To get a full, pro correct, yes. But if you don't have that, you run the test anyway. Correct, right? yes. And that's how you get these partial results. Isn't that true? That is true, yes. And that's why in a lot of the places along the loci, it'll show NR, meaning no result? No result is NR, yes. So you then have just a partial DNA, and, you're, and the machine is still trying to run the uh, ratio, the likelihood ratio against a partial DNA result, isn't it? We could try and run a likelihood ratio of a partial, yes. And doesn't STR mix actually add in, like presume what if there was this extra allele in there? Isn't that part of its whole process? The whole process is trying to explain what makes up that profile, yes, by how the PCR program works, which is the amplification process. It knows how it works and is trying to use those, um, the word I'm looking for, use the way PCR works in order to come up with the best explanation for that profile, whether it be a full profile or a partial profile. It produces these individual components with weights to them. So this isn't like AI, though, right? It's not artificial intelligence, but it's something like that, right? No, we know, we know how it works. We know the method, method, mathematical process that's being used, the MCMC, as you refer to, and the biological modeling of the PCR reaction and it's doing all these iterations to best describe that DNA profile. I understand, but what I, getting back to what I was trying to say is, it is filling in, it says, what if the missing uh, allele was X or seven or 12, whatever, and then runs the program again to see if it was that, how would it come out in the likelihood? Isn't that part of the process? Not to do with the likelihood ratio. It's weighing, it's doing all those weights first. But it also assumes missing data and it adds it in as a part of its probability, isn't it? It's, it's giving weights to possible explanations. Including. So it does look at other things, but it, it's like a game of hot and cold. It's yes. proposing this type to make up the profile. And if it is a hot or a good explanation, it goes towards that um, iteration. If it's not a good it'll be a cold and it will go in a different direction to try and best explain 
the different DNA types that are making up that profile. Right. And then those weights are used then after it comes to a conclusion on what is the best explanation, then it uses those weights to calculate that likelihood ratio. And so you're accepting the calculations from the program for your conclusions that you've told us about today, right? Yes. All right. When it comes to this sample, we talked about how little it could be. And, and just for reference, it, would a period on a daily newspaper be larger than the uh, 20 picograms that we're talking about in terms of just being able to visualize it. You can't visualize 20 picograms. It's no. way microscopic, right? Correct. And the only way that you're able to even run this process is you do uh, some kind of uh, the equivalent of like photocopying the sample you have, right? Correct. So you, you have a process that's, you know, I'm not challenging, it's just established. So you sort of mimeograph for those of us who are a little bit older, or you photocopy the uh, data so you have enough to then run through your program, right? We have enough so that we hopefully can develop a DNA profile. Now, there's also a major and minor contributor to various uh, samples. If there's more than one contributor to a sample, is that true? Sometimes that can be determined, yes. Who decides what those percentages of major and minor contributors is going to be? Well, we can look at it as a DNA analyst and, and estimate, but when we run through star mix, it also gives a weight to what each contributor is, is contributing to that profile. And again, this is calculating based on the quantity of what is now in the system based on your multiplication or photocopying of it into making it a larger sample, right? Based on, yes, what I'm, the number of contributors I'm calling it and then the, the DNA profile result that we obtained, yes. And when we're talking about major and minor contributors, if it's, I don't know, 60 or 70 percent and the others are, and the other contributors are 20 and 30 percent, the person, the, let me rephrase that, the sample with the higher percentage is considered the major contributor, right? That would be yes. And that all the lower numbers are the minor contributors, right? <clears throat> yes, but sometimes you can't determine a major contributor and a minor contributor. Well, when you say you can't, but can STR mix? Well, STR mix doesn't ever call anything a major and a minor. It just gives you those percentages to make it to 100. Do you ever disagree with its percentages? Are you able to recalculate that, saying this is wrong? We do. That's one of the parameters that we do check to make sure StarMix runs correctly. So, Attorney Schoenhorn, uh, if the next series of questions do not concern major and minor contributors, it's mm -hmm. 3 o'clock. That's correct. So and I think this would be a good place to stop for the day. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we conclude the evidence for today. Uh, we suggest again that you would check your check the judicial branch website tomorrow because the weather may be such that there may be a delayed opening. And we would ask that you uh, please do not discuss the case and have a good evening. <coughs>